Well, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here uh, today. Uh, today I'm going to tell two narratives. One is I'm going to tell you about our research using psilocybin assisted psychotherapy with cancer patients and our preliminary results. Uh, and then I'm going to tell a story that's a little bit similar to Michael's. Uh, we have a planned study at NYU to use psilocybin assisted uh, psychotherapy for alcoholics. Um, so disclosures, I'm a member of the Hefter uh, Research Institute and I re received my research funding uh, from NIDA Hefter and the NYU Langone Medical Center. So um, I have an 11 year old son and uh, he's been doing montages uh, at school so I think I borrowed from him because it's more uh, entertaining to tell a story in pictures. Um, and so pop quiz. Um, now when I did this, this is the story uh, of the use, the history of psychedelics to treat addiction and I'm going to tell the story today by going through these rows and some of you are sitting in the audience. So uh, who's that right there? So that's William James. Dave Nichols, who's that? That's Arthur Hafter. Who's that? That's Carl Jung, Bill Wilson, Albert Hoffman. Right, so this is the, I'm going to tell a story here, but then the next story here, who's that? Humphrey Osman, you know that guy? Sidney Cohen, that handsome man, Walter Pankey, Stan Groff. And um, I won't go through the rest here, but um, I'm going to come back to this picture. Now, there's a, another picture here. This has to do with the use of psychedelics uh, in terminal cancer. Uh, and that's a young Irving Yalom. Uh, and you can notice when I did all these pictures, I realized it's mostly men, all men, right? Uh, so what I did for the ladies is I went through the history of psychedelic women, right? So you got to do that. Yeah. So who's that? Maria Sabina, who's that? Valentina Wasson, right? She's very important. Betty Eisner, UCLA. Loretta Bender, who's the first psychedelic researcher at NYU. Uh, who's that? Laura Huxley, Helen Bonney, who's that? That's a young Ann Shulkin, yeah. And Mary Kuzumano. I'll talk about Mary today, because I had dinner with her, and it was a lot about love. There's a, a lot of love going on. And, and Annie Mithoffer, all of these people here are part of our NYU team. They are um, therapists, and, uh, and then we have um, Alicia, and uh, we'll go through all these people here as well. Okay. Uh, and some more pictures. Um, so I'm going to talk about the serotonergic hallucinogens today and the indole alkalamines include the drugs like ayahuasca and psilocybin and LSD and the phenylalkylamines, the prototype is, is mescaline. Um, and uh, you guys have heard a lot about a mystical experience. You know, when I was a psychiatric trainee, um, I didn't hear anything about psychosis that had a positive valence. If you talked about uh, having unitary experiences or being transcended to another place, a time in reality, we would call that psychosis. And in the Bellevue ER, we would admit you inpatient. Um, so mystical experiences provoke uh, a kind of crisis of nomenclature within psychiatry. How do you define these kinds of alterations of consciousness that have a positive uh, attribute to them? So I think we, uh, we need a better definition system. Um, and to think about psilocybin, psilocybin is very interesting because it's, uh, it's doable in the laboratory. It's, it's very hard to sit there from 8 in the morning to 5 at night to do a session. And I, I think if we did LSD, my wife would divorce me, you know, because I'd, I'd be home too late. So with psilocybin, it's doable uh, within the laboratory setting, uh, but still hard, still hard to sit there. Now, we have two neuroimaging teams, one in Switzerland and, and one in Great Britain, that have come to two different conclusions in terms of what happens when you give psilocybin. Franz Wollenweider's team uh, gave oral psilocybin and found marked activation of prefrontal cortical regions and temporal media cortex. Um, and uh, that was interesting. This was PET um, because the group at Imperial College of London, and I feel like today's lecture I'm going to say a lot of like ditto or what he said because a lot of these uh, lectures have been given. So I think Robin is here in the audience, so he's going to talk all about this. But this was interesting. This was IV psilocybin. And what they found um, was deactivation of prefrontal cortical regions, not activation. And interestingly, they found deactivation of the default mode network. And when they did functional connectivity, there was increased connectivity between the default mode network and the task positive network, which is something that you see uh, in certain states of psychosis and meditation. And, and Robin's going to talk more about that. But these were divergent findings. And the more we learn about the neurobiology of psychedelics, it's really, really interesting. So these drugs um, are all Schedule One, And by definition, that means there's no accepted medical use. There's lack of safety um, for use under medical supervision. And they, these drugs are of the highest addictive liability. So we're going to go back in history to take a look at uh, this and to look specifically at the serotonergic hallucinogens to understand how addictive uh, they are or not. 
Uh, all right, so back to history here. So back in the early days of psychopharmacology, what are the great psychopharmacologists did? Well, they all self-ingested, right? That's what you did. People got in trouble later for doing that, and we don't, we don't do that anymore. But um, both Arthur Hefter and Louis Lewin got samples of mescaline and self-experimented. And Louis Lewin was so um, intrigued by it all, he wrote a book, Fantastica, which I think is probably the most apt term of all of these uh, terms that come hard to truly describe. These states. So this was the beginning of um, research in psychedelics from an academic perspective, and there was some interest in mescaline that endured, but, um, but essentially things picked up again in Switzerland um, in 1943. So we had Albert Hoffman, who was a Swiss chemist at Sandoz, and you all know the story, but he accidentally, while trying to make these ergot derivatives to help women that had blood loss during pregnancy, happened upon these uh, lysergamides. He made them in 38, but in 43 he had some premonition to go back and accidentally dosed himself and discovered uh, LSD. Um, he went back to, um, to Sandoz and they started testing LSD among each other, among animals, and they found that it had no known toxic dose. And in 47, Sandoz makes LSD and makes it available to psychiatric researchers and psychiatrists throughout the country, which starts this interesting uh, experiment of um, psychedelics within academia, and people thought that these states are similar to psychotic states, so there was excitement about understanding the biological basis of psychosis. Uh, and in addition, the psychoanalysts, this was the heyday of psychoanalysis, and the analysts loved it because they were constantly looking for the you know, royal road to the unconscious, and dreams was the, the one mechanism to do that, but this was the real sort of royal road, um, and had some favor among the analysts, especially in, in the European models. Um, so articles start to appear with LSD, LSD is brought the United States, work begins, uh, begins in Boston and Los Angeles. And a very interesting time, um, psychiatrists start to self-administer LSD. Um, psychiatry clerkship organi organizers take LSD with their medical students. This happened at places like UCSF and, and NYU. So the medical student or the psychiatrist could have empathic resonance with the mind of the psychotic patient. So there's an interesting time to go to medical school. Um, and psychiatrists started using it clinically. I mean, it was not only um, available through research, you could get it. And I'll tell the tale of Oscar Janiger in Los Angeles. He gave it to thousands of people, including um, celebrities, et cetera. So it becomes available and is used clinically. And then, of course, you know, the CIA gets involved to try to weaponize hallucinogens. Um, and very interestingly, uh, Gordon Wasson is a banker in New York, but his wife, Valentina, is an amateur mycologist, um, and she is looking for this agent that's used by indigenous cultures in Mexico, and that's about all she knew. In fact, she thought that uh, it may be peyote. There's something about these agents historically where they create a lot of excitement, and then something happens and they are repressed, and it's happened throughout time. It's happened within academia, and we now are sort of need to learn from the past to, to not repeat it, but they went to, to Mexico and they found um, Maria Sabina, and um, Gordon Watson and Valentina become the first Westerners to undergo a psilocybin experience. And um, uh, Gordon Watson was friends with Albert Hoffman. He sends the, the mushrooms to Albert Hoffman. He isolates the psychoactive alkaloid, psilocybin. Uh, and then Life magazine in like 1957 does an article uh, about all this. And um, Timothy Leary reads that and takes um, psilocybin in Cuernavaca and in 1960 starts the Harvard Psilocybin Project. Um, and we'll talk about the Spring Grove group as well. But, um, and I'll get to Humphrey Osmond a little bit later, but he does a lot of work with alcoholics in Canada. Um, and this was part of mainstream academic psychiatry. You know, most psychiatrists, when they ask them about LSD, they say, oh, you know, seven hits makes you insane. It's a very dangerous drug. None of them have any clue that this was part of American psychiatry for a considerable period of time with a considerable number of research participants uh, that were treated. And they ended up being hundreds of patients and, and tens of thousands of participants. Um, and there's two models that emerged uh, and, and that's been discussed. This really was the psychedelic dream team, and Bill Richards is here in the audience. Uh, this was um, this amazing team that was assembled at Spring Grove that I think if the work continued here, uh, we would have psychedelics as medicines now for a whole host of conditions. This really was the right way um, to do it. They had a multidisciplinary team. They did a cancer study by having uh, working with an oncologist who sent um, all of the patients. Uh, and these were a team of very experienced psychiatrists and psychologists. Uh, and unfortunately, before things really got cooking and going well here, it all came to an end. So what, what did happen? Um, well, um, 
Unfortunately, the, the agents escaped from clinical laboratory research settings and they went out into the public. And the American public, I don't think, was ready. It was, uh, you know, end of the 50s and there was a lot of political turmoil. And what happened is um, LSD was started to be used uh, by the mass public. And, and these drugs are not drugs that should be used indiscriminately um, by anyone. Uh, they have a, a downside and a danger. They're sacred medicinal compounds that should be used in a certain kind of setting um, and only with certain kind of individuals. And the problem is, um, you know, they were, they're created problems. So people that are predisposed to psychosis, the 18-year-old who goes to college and tries LSD for the first time and becomes psychotic, and that um, starts uh, his schizophrenia, even though LSD does not cause schizophrenia. There were a lot of casualties. Um, and uh, Richard Nixon got very concerned about this. And um, essentially, the Controlled Substance Act of 1970, which was the beginning of the war on drugs, which really has been a disaster for addicts because we've taken a medical illness and, can, and criminalized it. Uh, and in many ways it was because um, there was a grave concern about what these consciousness expanding drugs were doing to the American public. Um, and so this system was put in place in 1970 um, and we'll talk about um, if, if the serotonergic hallucinogens really belong in that category uh, or not. But at the end there were um, a thousand articles, tens of thousands of participants and interestingly as Michael mentioned alcoholism was the most studied indication. If you take Humphrey Osmond by himself, he did open label trials, there were several thousand alcoholics and if you look at um, the other trials in the US there were close to a thousand people and about um, 536 in, that, uh, in the well designed trials. Methodology um, of use uh, and set and setting were all put in place and safety was determined that, that most of the serotonergic hallucinogens except maybe Ibogaine are incredibly safe from a medical perspective. They have a very low physiologic toxicity. The main problem has to do with the adverse psychological effects and if you properly screen individuals um, the safety data is very robust both historically and also in the last 40 years the 400 so participants that have received psilocybin in the United States, there have been no uh, major serious adverse events, which, uh, which is a testament to uh, the safety of doing this in a, in a clinical setting. Um, and I won't go over this, you've, you've heard this enough. Um, Hopkins, I'm going to show a dose response study that they've done um, recently to kind of take, to get a sense of uh, what the optimal dose is. Um, and interestingly, a new therapy model, when I was training as a psychiatrist, you know, there was uh, you as the psychiatrist and there's the patient, one doctor, one patient. But interestingly, they developed a model of two therapists um, and a diet team, usually male, female. Um, and uh, there was therapy training that went on. In fact, Jeff Gus is going to talk about our psychedelic psychotherapy training program at NYU. But it's an interesting model of training two therapists. And this is how Jeff does it. We go to Hawaii and this is the, the final ceremony. You get to sit by the water, I wish. Um, but, you know, two therapists, one patient, which, which for me has, has been very interesting uh, to take a look at that. And, and uh, this is the psilocybin that we have in our study. It is uh, one gram that's stored in a thousand pound safe. It's the only substance that's stored there. And here's a compounded pill. This is our treatment room and this is the Hopkins treatment room. And, and this is exactly what the methodology um, the 50s to 70s was, that comfortable living room like setting. Uh, two therapists. In many ways, we have sort of like left off from uh, from the old group. But people always ask me, why two therapists? Why male, female? Why music? Why introspection? And I don't know because they they said so. So <laughs> we'll figure it out later. All right. So back to the montage. Um, so this is the montage that has to do with um, cancer and anxiety. And and you guys who went to Dr. Boss's lecture have seen this slide, but who wants to die in an ICU setting in the hospital? Raise your hand. Yes, there's always, uh, there's always the near-death experience people that, uh, that, like, that like that one. Uh, who'd like to die in a nursing home? Uh, how about in a hospice? Who'd like to die good death at home with your family all around you? And yeah, with hospice, yeah. Now, now, <laughs> You know, unfortunately, the, the human encounter with death in the United States has been farmed out to academic medicine or medicine in general. And medicine is just not trained how to deal with patients. Uh, and we don't, I was never trained how to administer a good death. Uh, that really, that construct uh, was never taught to me. And so, as physicians, we're trained to save and extend life. And, but I think in many ways, we're, um, we're failing our patients because they're really dying in places they don't want to die. Most. Um, individuals are dying within hospital settings and they're not dying where they want to die and it's, it's a real problem. 
Uh, Dr. Bossis mentioned this yesterday, but um, palliative care, um, the domain of spirituality comes up again and again, and it's a vital domain uh, to understand the needs of patients that have existential distress associated with having a terminal illness. And, and terminal illness, like addiction, are type of spiritual disorders. Um, and if you define a, a spiritual distress as unable to find sources of hope, love, meaning, value, comfort, strength, connection. Um, you really see this with cancer patients. You know, we all are going to die, but we all have, um, you know, cognitive illusions that allow the distance to death to be somewhere off in the future. But then when you go see your oncologist and your oncologist says, well, actually, it's much closer. Um, you have terminal cancer and you'll be dead in, you know, nine to 12 months. It, it really is awful for patients. And, um, and we've had young patients now in the study. We've treated a 26-year-old and um, he developed illness when he was 19, and it really provoked a kind of crisis of meaning uh, for him, uh, which was interesting because his session um, sort of like restored that faith uh, in God as part of it. But um, uh, cancer is, is a disaster, and, and there's a kind of differential uh, responsivity to having cancer. You have some people that sort of cope through denial. They say, yeah, I have this cancer, but it's okay, I'm gonna be fine. It's not a big deal. It's not impacting my life that much. Um, and then you have the kind of meaning makers that take cancer and for them, um, they're able to say, oh, you know, cancer is like this amazing gift. You know, it helped me realize that I was wasting my time doing X, Y, and Z. And what's really important, what's really fundamental is being home with my family or whatever the case may be. I'm glad and grateful that I got cancer. Um, and then uh, there's a group of people that we deal with in the study that have existential distress. And for them, they fall apart psychologically. Uh, and it's a, a real nightmare for them. They have remorse, powerlessness, futility, meaningless of life. They're unable to connect to their loved ones. They're unable to connect to sources of transcendence. Um, and they're depressed, hopeless, and suicidal. And they have a hastened desire to want to die. And so this, as a, from a psychiatric perspective, this is a group of people that we really have to uh, pay a lot of attention to uh, to prevent really bad outcomes. Um, and if you look at the prevalence of psychiatric illness in people that have advanced illness with cancer, it's, it's very high. If you look at um, anxiety uh, disorders, um, you know, you have as, as much as uh, two out of three people to 50 percent. Um, and same thing with depression. It's really interesting that you have also high rates of distress amongst family members. The cancer uh, is more than an illness of the patient. It's an illness of the family system. And the family members are very distressed. In fact, several people have mentioned, why don't we do a study you know, that includes family members? And um, I think that's a great idea, because they really are going through their own uh, turmoil. And uh, it's important to, to think of them and to think of uh, the person getting better within a family system. So there's been a lot of work, a lot of it at um, Sloan Kettering, looking at the correlation between um, uh, people that, ha that are terminally ill, that have a hastened desire to die, and it's correlated with being, having major depression, hopelessness, pain, and um, diminution of spiritual states. And another way of looking at it in these studies is um, increased spiritual states are correlated with a decrease in desire for hastened death, hopelessness, depression, and suicidal ideation. So it, it sort of makes one think, well, how can we improve uh, spiritual states and end of life? How can we do it psychopharmacologically? And are there any psychosocial treatments, psychotherapies that are specifically designed to enhance meaning, to make meaning in people that have uh, terminal illness. And, I, and I'll talk about um, several that exist. And Dr. Bossis mentioned this, but you know, a good death really, um, you need to be able to control pain, prepare for death. People still want to be able to contribute to others. Um, and spirituality and meaning keep coming up again and again, people that are, have terminal illness. Um, and so how can we uh, figure out a construct, both um, pharmacologically and a psychosocial platform to treat these kinds of patients? Um, so uh, Kierkegaard, John Paul Sartre, um, were existential philosophers, and it was actually John Paul Sartre who also became a, a psychologist, and um, the, uh, there was the application of existential philosophy within uh, psychiatry and mental health as a, as a treatment. Um, and, um, you know, we have uh, people like Irving Yalom uh, and Viktor Frankl that helped establish it within psychiatry, uh, and then other people who are psycho-oncologists who have come up with a whole group of different treatments, psychotherapies that are existentially based. And in designing our study, we picked um, from several of these to have some sort of platform uh, to be able to leverage the, uh, the experience that the patients have in the study. Now, Eric Cast was a really interesting guy. Um, during the time that LSD was available, he was an internist in Chicago. He heard about this new drug, LSD. He didn't know anything about it, but he decided to order some LSD. 
Um, and we now know that preparation is key for patients, but Cass didn't know that. So he, um, he had a lot of patients that had terminal illness, hundreds of them, that um, were essentially within three to six months of death. And um, what he started to do is he came by in the morning with the LSD, and he said, hi, I'm Dr. Cast. I have a, um, a new compound for you that we're going to try. He would have them stick out their tongue. Um, he would give it to them, and he would say, well, I'll see you later in the day. Right? So um, that's like not a model of how you want to do it. But, but he did it like hundreds of times that way. I mean, really, really interesting stuff. And um, what he found was pretty fascinating. He, um, he did a controlled trial comparing uh, LSD to opiate pharmacotherapy and um, looked at patients acutely in a sustained manner and found that the LSD group, especially in the long term, had diminution of pain and it uh, was sustained for several weeks, uh, which was a really interesting finding. And that's one of the reasons that our groups that are doing uh, cancer research are looking at pain. But in addition, he also found that patients um, had decreased depressed mood, improved sleep, and he noticed, interestingly, that their fear of death was, uh, was diminished. Um, and he just kept doing it with little preparation and kept finding the same sort of thing, decreased fear of death um, and lasting several weeks, people describing happy oceanic um, feelings. And he was actually one of the people when LSD was um, being put into Schedule 1 that went to Congress and said, no, this was you know, uh, a really interesting thing uh, and we really think this was a novel treatment for pain. So I, I think that, um, I don't know, you know, psilocybin and LSD pharmacologically are different. I don't know if there's something specific about um, LSD in terms of anti-pain, but it's interesting to consider. And pain is one of these things in terminal illness that you really have to control or this drives people uh, to be very distressed and to become suicidal uh, as well. So back to, um, to Spring Grove. Um, now, this was the group led by Stan Groff, and, and this was really the data set that existed for terminal cancer. And um, as Bill Richards knows, the group was starting out uh, to study addiction, and what happened is one of the nurses at Spring Grove became sick with, um, with terminal breast cancer, and she wanted to know could this treatment be available for someone like her. And so the whole team shifted to this, this focus, and, the, and there was a study done. Um, and essentially the inclusion and exclusion criteria are essentially the same ones used in all of our studies, that they included people that had um, uh, cancer, terminal cancer uh, and anxiety. They excluded people with major mental illness, major medical illness, and measured anxiety, depression, um, pain, mystical states. And, and this, there's no control group here. Um, and what they found is that um, you know, within the, the one group, there was a significant reduction pre, post, and depression anxiety, pain, fear of death, uh, and they found that, um, that there was global improvement in the majority of people, and some people didn't get better, and, and a small percentage uh, got worse. Um, but they never were able to go on to a controlled trial because the music uh, had to stop. Um, but if we were to do a controlled trial, and if we were to um, look at the right way to do it, this is Chuck Brown at Penn that, um, that goes through the ways that we would want to do it. And essentially, this is the model that we all use now in, the, in our center. So, so going back to this, how can we uh, increase spiritual states? And, and this really has to do, I think, with a therapeutic mysticism. And I think this was something Carl Jung was trying to introduce within medicine, but, but failed because Freud and others were very concerned that religion and spirituality would get mixed with medicine. And, um, but I was hanging out with Mary Cusimano yesterday. Where, Mary, where are you? Uh, so um, there was Mary was just emanating love. It was all about love, right? And, and Mary and Tony, um, I think I'm going to write a book about love and go on a tour about it. But I think, Mary, that you've gotten a contact uh, buzz from all the psilocybin you've administered. And I think that love has uh, oozed into you, and now it's just oozing out. Um, but it's almost a cliche, but it, it's really true that the majority of patients, they say the same thing. I have a profound sense of love, of feeling loved, of you know the power of love. And, and even though as corny as it sounds, the, there really is is something there that patients have a profound sense of love and peace um, and it makes them feel better which really is a I think a, we have to ultimately analyze our data but it's really interesting to see um, and uh, that's a, that's Roland Griffiths there you know the the team that's really leading the way in the world in psychedelic research is the Johns Hopkins team uh, and uh, these guys are amazing um, they're doing so many different studies and uh, really have inspired so many of us and they're really just an awesome group of individuals uh, that keeps growing over time, um, and uh, so thank you to them. And they have uh, published so much interesting stuff that's been so important 
for all of us. Um, in the normal volunteer study of 36 hallucinogen naive individuals in a controlled trial with Ritalin, um, they found, uh, you know, this was the sort of like uh, Good Friday experiment redo, but with excellent data showing that psilocybin um, acutely and at 14 months later, the participants attribute um, having a mystical experience. And, and these data always blow me away. The majority of people thinking that um, experiencing these events as the singular top five most significant experiences of their entire lives, up there with having kids. Uh, and these are profound experiences that have stuck with these individuals that have, at 14 months later, they continue to attribute positive changes in their attitudes, and even altruism. You know, in medical, student, in medical school, we try to train medical students to be warmer and more empathic, and, and I think unless you have good parents and you're already altruistic, I'm not sure how you, you get people to be like this, but it would be interesting if pharmacologically we could induce altruism. I think there would be a lot of uh, applications to that. But I think these people were, you know, uh, spiritual seekers already. Maybe they were already in that direction. But I, I think it's very interesting to consider pharmacologically. You think of antisocial personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder. The, these have core deficits in empathic resonance. So, um, and at 14 months later, this, the mysticism, so the degree of, of mysticality um, is correlated with lasting benefit, uh, you know, over a year later. And that is a novel finding uh, within medicine. So you know this handsome fellow, Dr. Grobe, um, and this is another really amazing team. The UCLA team, you know, Sidney Cohen was an amazing psychedelic researcher that sort of everyone forgets about, but he was doing excellent work with Betty Eisner and Gary Fisher, and, and Carl Janiger was in private practice in LA, but Charlie picked this whole thing up and completed his trial, um, and uh, you know, uh, Aldous Huxley here, and, and Laura Huxley, and Alicia Danforth, and um, and this was published in the Archives of General Psychiatry. Th this study is very similar to ours. There was a, a slightly lower dose, but same inclusion, exclusion criteria, um, preparatory psychotherapy, taking a narrative of the patient's life, taking a narrative of cancer and how it's disproportionately affected them, taking a spiritual history, uh, focusing on safety, and then the methodology of lying on a couch, pre-selected music, focused in, uh, internally, and then integrative um, Psychotherapy, the UCLA room, uh, pre and post. That's that's how they do it on the West Coast. You just throw up some tie dye stuff, and <laughs> I like that. Um, and these results, um, it was it was a small sample, 12, but and most of them, interestingly, women. And we're finding in our study as well, two to one women to men. Why why is that? Because women are just better, right? They're, braver or I, I don't know but um, but there were no no major adverse medical events or psychiatric events and compared to placebo the psilocybin group was much more likely to induce alterations of consciousness that are consistent with mysticism um, and what Charlie found was was very interesting if you look at this as the Spielberg trait um, anxiety inventory and this is a measure of trait anxiety here at, at one month and three months the participants and, and the crossover, I think, occurred at a month. So they both had gotten one dose of psilocybin and placebo. But interestingly, trait anxiety, which is a measure more of sort of longer term, how anxious you are, uh, was diminished at, at one month and three months. So that, that was an interesting finding. Um, and depression at six months, at the end of the trial, and again, we don't know if this is the psilocybin, the placebo, um, psychotherapy, tincture of love of being in a clinical trial, but at six months later, there was a significant drop in depression from, from the baseline. And if you look at the POMS, which is another measure of depression, there were some acute trend changes uh, between the different groups that probably if the um, N were higher and the dose were higher would have been significant and you would have seen acute reductions in distress. So at NYU, we are racing to finish our trial and Johns Hopkins is as well. Um, our trial is nine months long. Uh, it's a crossover at seven weeks. Our dose of psilocybin uh, is a sort of moderate to high dose. We include people, we initially included people that had um, a terminal cancer only, but we since then have increased that to include people that have any stage of cancer because um, you, know, you don't have to be dying of cancer to have death anxiety. Uh, we realized we were meeting people that um, had cancer and they could even be in remission, but they still were traumatized by the cancer and had enormous distress, couldn't get beyond it, and they kept asking us, you know, couldn't we benefit from, from this as well? So we have changed our protocol, um, and it, we now include any stage of cancer as long as you have distress associated with the cancer. And it's interesting to treat people who are dying and then those that are not, and, and the differences 
uh, that come up. Now, we rule out major medical illness, um, and we, we rule out uh, certain uh, medications. From a psychiatric perspective, you most certainly want to uh, rule out people that have psychotic spectrum illness, either schizophrenia, schizoaffective, or affective psychosis, like um, bipolar one disorder with psychotic features, that these are agents that should not be used on people that are psychotic or who have psychotic diathesis. Those people should be ruled out. Um, and so we do that in the study. And we have a, a bunch of outcome measures, um, anxieties, the, the, the first one, and then depression, pain, uh, acceptance of disease progression. And again, we have preparatory psychotherapy, the dosing sessions, and integrative psychotherapy. And our integrative model we've drawn from a whole host of different uh, psychotherapies, including ones that are existentially oriented. I think to do this kind of work, you have to have psychodynamic or analytically oriented training because the imagery and the symbolism is so rich. Um, in a way, it's like being with patients that are having a waking dream. So you really have to think symbolically and be able to understand and extract the enormous meaning that these experiences uh, can occasion. And we also use CBT models uh, and some other models as well. It took a, a couple years to get approval to do the study. It, um, it's hard to get approval, but it's much, much easier now because of the work of people like Charlie and Roland uh, and others who really were pioneers in this field. It's much easier to work with the FDA. Um, interestingly, we had full approval for the study, but it was we did not have a site to do it. We had approval from uh, the FDA and the DEA and the medical school, uh, but the problem is we, we just didn't have a, a host. And so the NYU College of Dentistry came out of the blue, and I didn't even know we had a College of Dentistry at NYU, but they came out of the blue to save us, and uh, I love those dentists. So I think this is the only psychedelic study ever that's taken place in a dental center. Um, so, but they, they've really been amazing, and they've given us an entire room that we can use, um, which looks like this. It used to look like a hospital-looking room, but they were really gracious and allowed us to make it into a very beautiful-looking room with all the requisite icons and suggestive symbols. And here's our team. Uh, it's Tony Bosses, who you heard yesterday, Jeff Gus, um, Gabby. Gabby, you here in the audience? Uh, there's Gabby. Gabby's our awesome project manager who saved our project because uh, she's been able, yeah. We got a scary letter from the, the cancer center. This was like a year and a half ago, and it said, uh, Dear Dr. Ross, we are uh, here to inform you that um, you are, you've fallen below your accrual target for the study and that we are an affiliate of the National Cancer Institute, and if you don't get to this number in six months, you're finished. And I was like, oh boy. So we, we had our existential crises moment for the study, which we've had many, um, and for some reason, we, things just keep booing us along, whether it's dentists or specific individuals. So we um, went to one of our donors and said, you know, we, we really need more personnel. So we were able to hire Gabby. And to recruit cancer patients, um, I thought it was maybe political why we weren't getting patients. But the reality is cancer patients, they very rarely go into clinical trials. Only about 3% do. And um, you have to be in the flow of traffic. Uh, and so we essentially were given entree into the NYU Clinical Cancer Center. We've parked ourselves there, and we are now in the direct flow of patients. And now we have more patients uh, that we can treat, and we have a very uh, steady flow, and I think we're, we're poised well to move on to a phase three uh, trial. And this is the rest of our team. So, so far we have dosed 21 individuals, uh, two to one women to men, um, and this is the age range and the average. Very interestingly, the majority of people have been hallucinogen naive. Now, I thought these would be biased people from the 60s that did psychedelics. They thought that they were really awesome and amazing, and they're coming back to do them again. But the reality is these, um, the typical patient is a woman in her 50s with terminal breast cancer who was scared and anxious and who's never done psychedelics. In fact, stayed away from them because was concerned in the 60s for what may happen in uncontrolled settings. So I think it's, it's more powerful when you have people, you know, you have less um, sort of expectancy bias. The majority of our patients have been towards the sicker end of the spectrum in terms of staging. We've made a great connection with our guy and onc group, uh, but you can see we've treated, treated people with a variety of, of different cancers. Now, the data is yet to be formally analyzed, but anecdotally, um, it's, it's been really remarkable. Uh, these are findings that I've never sort of seen as a psychiatrist. I've you know, heard of people, hey, when you work in the addiction world, you're used to people having near-death experiences and dramatic change, so I, I was sort of used to that. Um, but what we found here um, has been really interesting in that we've had both acute and sustained 
reductions in death anxiety. One patient in particular had resolution of death anxiety that's persisted now for 14 months. We've seen um, improvements in mood. People uh, have greater integration back into their lives, improved family functioning, improved spiritual states. Um, and it's very interesting that half of the day it's, um, is sort of the psychedelic model. Patients are sort of deep down having a mystical experience, but they inevitably come out of that and then start to tell us these amazing stories of places they've been and things that they've felt. And it becomes the, the latter part of the day more like a psycholytically oriented um, therapy, a little bit like being with someone who's having a waking dream. And so in a way, we sort of use both models. The majority of patients um, say, oh, you know, I wish I could have another experience, especially the ones that are naive. They say, you know, I understand the terrain now, and, and I would have gone deeper into it. Um, and so, you know, we have to think about that in future studies. So this is data from the first five patients, and we're, we don't know whether, you know, dose A or dose B was psilocybin. But, um, you know, we see in almost all the patients this sort of tincture of people here to help me. And almost just engagement with the study, people start to feel better. But this person here, and most likely this uh, was probably a psilocybin dose, this person had a very dramatic reduction of anxiety, and you can see it persisted until the end of the study um, here. And here's a, another example of somebody that had a big drop in anxiety from the first dosing session. Um, you know, with cancer, though, the problem is that people have scans and they get super anxious. So we've had people that feel better, but then on a particular day had a scan that was bad and they're anxiety can fluctuate, so it's a, a difficult illness. This may be an example of someone that got a, a dosing session after dose B, and you can see reduction here, but you know, then it sort of comes up. And everyone from the beginning to the end, everyone is less anxious at the end of the study than, than the beginning. But you can see that there's big fluctuations, um, and this person had some bad news here at this moment, but you can see sort of, you know, the, the general trend is, is down, but there are fluctuations. This is only the first five. So, you know, cautious to interpret too much. We really have to look at the data. I think we have to be clear that um, even though it looks as if there is an effect, it, it may, may not be. Uh, we have to be open. So that's it for the cancer story. I want to switch, um, and Michael's really made this a lot easier uh, for me. But Humphrey Osmond really was a pioneer. He was a, um, he was a British psychiatrist who relocated to Canada, and he heard about this LSD treatment, and he started treating um, thousands of alcoholics. Um, and he, his initial model, as Michael mentioned, was um, aversive counter conditioning. That there was, um, people knew that the delirium tremens could scare people, you know, straight essentially. That, ah, oh, that was so scary, I almost died, I want to get sober. So that was his initial model, but he started treating people and he realized that people were having these positive e experiences and mystical experiences. And um, he, he thought that the experiences were so unique that you couldn't have blinding integrity and didn't bother with that, and, and found rates of abstinence that were pretty high, but we don't really know how to interpret this. But this was really interesting, um, what Michael mentioned, that when you put all of the well-controlled trials together for alcoholism, it was amazing that there was a, a treatment effect uh, in this meta-analysis, and this is a big number. If you do a phase three trial, you know, you need three, four hundred. So in a way, they did something close to a phase three trial and had a treatment effect. So this is very encouraging data for a group of us to go back and to try hallucinogen treatment models for addiction. So, so back to the definition of Schedule 1. And, and let's see if the serotonergic hallucinogens really fall into this. So you know a drug of abuse is addictive. There are various models. So if you give an animal the ability to self-administer any drug of abuse that's reinforcing, it will continue to press for that, either intravenously or intrathecally. So this happens with cocaine, alcohol, tobacco. But if you give a lab animal LSD, it will not continue to self-administer it, or psilocybin. He, well, he might put on a tie-dye t-shirt and, you know, put on the Grateful Dead and, and dance around and get lost for several hours, lose his sense of rat self, and, and then it always comes back. You gotta tell it, it'll, it'll come back. And the other model is condition place preference, right? That if you, initially the animal forages back and forth, it gets a hit of something that's rewarding, goes back to this area, and this, um, you can get every drug of abuse to do this, except psilocybin and LSD do not do this. The nucleus accumbens is a very special part of the brain that's involved with reward, and learning as part of our survival. Every normative reward like food acquisition, water, sex, nurturing, go through this pathway. Every drug of abuse hijacks this pathway and leads to super physiologic dopaminergic activation. And so when you give drugs of abuse to animals and humans, you image them, the nucleus accumbens lights up very dramatically. When you give uh, drugs like psilocybin to individuals, Although you get dopaminergic activation and increased signaling, the nucleus accumbens uh, does not light up appreciably. 
Um, and then epidemiologically, the third generation studies that have been done, when you go out and you look, is there such a thing as LSD dependence or addictive syndrome or psilocybin, it really doesn't exist. And so in, in, no, in all the ways that we measure whether a drug has true addictive liability, these drugs really fail the test to be in Schedule One. Um, and I'll get back to this in a, in a moment. Uh, the drugs, though, that really um, are interesting in terms of addictive liability, the most addictive drug is tobacco, and alcohol is in the middle. The, the psychedelic drugs are towards the least addictive, and, and these really are the NMDA antagonist drugs like ketamine and PCP. They have real addictive liability, but if you factor out the serotonergic hallucinogens, they, they really are not drugs that produce addictive syndromes. Um, and if you look at drug, drugs that are damaging in our society, the most damaging drug of abuse in the world is what? In terms of morbidity, mortality, preventable death, what is it? Alcohol. Alcohol is the number, number three cause of global disability. Um, tobacco is very close second. So these are drugs that are highly addictive and highly damaging. And they're scheduled, what are they scheduled again? They're, I think, I don't think they made the scheduling system. Um, so that's interesting. Um, all right, now, going back here uh, for a second. If you think of hallucinogen treatment models, there are really uh, several ways to look at it. One is that the drugs have some biological effect that is inducing sobriety. And how might that be? And, and a, a really interesting model for that is Ibogaine. Ibogaine treats opiate withdrawal. Now, if you give LSD to someone in opiate withdrawal, what will happen? They will be in opiate withdrawal and they'll be on LSD, right? But it won't, it won't help them at all. Ibogaine, uh, very interestingly, at one dose, can um, get rid of opiate withdrawal. And that really has nothing to do with its mystico-mimetic properties. That m must have something to do with um, signaling at the mu opiate receptor or some other biologic process. Uh, so that's a, a biological model. And 18MC is, you know, Ibogaine without the psychoactive stuff and the cardiac uh, toxicity. And I'll talk a little bit about the history of Ibogaine and, um, and NIDA funding. And the other way to think of it is, um, is mystico-mimetic experiences and spiritually induced experiences as helpful for addiction. And we have really good models through AA, the Native American Church with peyote, and, and the ayahuasca-based uh, religions. Um, and with these models, it's really important to, to talk about what comes next and how you link spiritually induced um, states from, uh, from pharmacology with psychosocial treatments and, and how to put those two together. Because recovery is not a quick one-shot thing. Um, big experiences may help uh, occasion long-term sobriety, but that's, that's rare and unlikely. You have to have something that contains and um, continues recovery. That, that's why AA is so interesting, because it's a ready-made recovery community. The number of people that have used serotonergic hallucinogens is very large. Uh, there's tens of millions of individuals that have tried these agents. The prevalence rates have gone down, um, but the United States um, had a big dose of consciousness expansion in the 60s. Um, and the story of Ibogaine is interesting. Howard Lotsoff um, was a heroin addict in Staten Island. And uh, he an ended up in the 60s trying Ibogaine as a way to try another drug that he had not been high from. Um, but he had something weird happen to him. Um, his opiate withdrawal symptoms went away. He had uh, a mystical experience. And, and this led him to long-term sobriety. And he became such a, an advocate for Ibogaine. Uh, NIDA eventually spent some money in the early 90s, several million, to study Ibogaine. But the politics of Ibogaine became quite toxic. And um, Ibogaine has a dark side to it. It can cause Brady arrhythmias and QT prolongations. And there have been uh, you know, at least 20 deaths associated with Ibogaine. So Ibogaine has sort of um, fallen off in terms of research. But 18MC, which is an iboga congener, uh, NIDA now has just committed about $6.5 million to savant to study it. So uh, NIDA has recognized there's something unique about iboga congeners that, that could be leveraged to treat addiction. Um, now, again, addiction, as I mentioned, is a kind of spiritual disorder. Addicts lose um, sense of meaning and hope and connection. And, and anyone that treats uh, enough addicted individuals, you have the scenario where at some point the person picks the drug over their kids. And that really always amazes me, that a drug can be so powerful and so compelling that you literally can go down the route of using the drugs um, over taking care of uh, your kids. And, that, and that's really how insidious and terrible addiction can be. And, and so part of the path to recovery is reconnecting within oneself and in the relational matrix of the world and in one's community and community of meeting. Um, and, uh, and so we, we know that spirituality has a protective 
impact on addiction. We know that spirituality has been described uh, within um, the addictive field for a long time as having therapeutic uh, force. And so can, how can we facilitate spiritual growth? And I would say AA and um, the UDV and the Native American Church are quite similar in this way. It's just in two of them they prescribe a sacramental hallucinogen, but otherwise they're very similar um, organizations. Um, with, and Michael talked about this. As far as we can tell, ethnographically, epidemiologically, the Native American Church has uh, very low rates of addiction. The highest rates of alcoholism are in certain um, communities within the Native American uh, community. They have very high rates of alcoholism, so it's particularly interesting the Native American Church does not. Now, they uh, prescribe a sacramental hallucinogen and they proscribe the use of drugs uh, and alcohol. And, um, and so if they indeed, we need better epidemiologic studies, but if they indeed have these very low rates of addiction, it's important to kind of un untangle why and what, um, what, what part the um, sacramental hallucinogen plays in all of that. We know that individuals that receive peyote you know, hundreds, thousands of doses over their lifetime, long term, um, that there are no adverse uh, medical or psychological effects associated with that. Um, we know that ayahuasca is already being used um, to treat addicted individuals and their communities uh, where this is happening. Uh, Takiwasi is an example of that. And we know as well, similar to the peyote studies, that um, individuals that use ayahuasca long term uh, do not have ill health effects. Um, it tends to be the opposite. Um, so back to the montage here, and back to this interesting story up here. So, so Carl Jung is treating uh, this alcoholic. His name was Roland H. Um, and you know, when you take an alcoholic or a schizophrenic patient and you put them on the psychoanalytic couch for five days, what happens per week? How does that methodology work? It doesn't work that well. So you remain psychotic, and it doesn't help your drinking. And we, we now know that psychoanalysis um, is not helpful for people who are actively using. So Carl Jung said to this alcoholic, Roland H., that's it, you're done, buddy. I did all I can, and I can't help you. Now, if Carl Jung can't help you and says it's over, you know, you know things are not looking so good. So actually, he told this guy, Roland H., go join this group, the Oxford group. It's this amazing group where people have religious conversions, and they get sober. So Roland H. goes and joins the Oxford group, has a religious conversion, and it, uh, ends up coming to America to proselytize. And Bill Wilson is a stockbroker in New York. He's living in Westchester, and he's hopelessly alcoholic. He, he in a way, has end-stage alcoholism. He's going to die from his illness. He has a doctor, uh, William Silkworth, who says, there's nothing I can do, but um, in Towns Hospital in New York, there's a guy, Charles Town, giving belladonna alkaloids as a novel treatment for addiction. And, and belladonna alkaloids have anti-muscarinic effects and can induce delirium and can induce mystical states. So Bill Wilson undergoes this treatment in 1934 and either having a little bit of DTs or certainly on belladonna alkaloids, he has the white light experience that Michael described. And he says, in utter despair, I cried out, if there be a God, will he show himself? There immediately came to me an illumination of enormous impact and dimension, something which I have tried to describe in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. My release from the alcohol exception was immediate. I knew I was a free man. So, so far, so good. Bill W. has a, a mystical experience. He doesn't want to drink anymore. But what happened when he went to Ohio a couple weeks later? So he goes to Ohio, and there he is at a bar. He's like, oh my God, you know, it's all going to come undone. He freaks out. He goes to the phone booth. He calls the local Oxford group chapter, and they put him in touch with Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob was a physician in recovery, and so they ended up having this very long um, first AA meeting. And really what sustained Bill Wilson was this. Um, so actually, Roland H. comes to him in the hospital, gives him the, the varieties of religious experience. He said, this book gave me the realization that most conversion experiences, whatever the variety, do have a common denominator of ego collapse at depth. In the wake of my spiritual experience, there came a vision of a society of alcoholics each identifying with and transmitting his experience to the next chain style. This concept proved to be the foundation of Alcoholics Anonymous. So it really is was the connectivity. And we've looked at studies now that look at the therapeutic ingredients of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and although spirituality and enhanced spiritual states and even spiritual conversion are important, it's actually the size of your sober network being large and the size of your using network being small that is the greatest predictor of how well you do in this ready-made recovery community. And I think this is important because if we're going to design trials of, of addicts, I think we need a container, something like AA, which, uh, which is there and goes along um, you know, with this model. And uh, Bill Wilson and Carl Young communicated. Um, 
you've heard a lot about mystical experience and transformation, uh, and we've seen this with the, the Johns Hopkins work, and the work with Catherine McLean is really, really interesting. Personality is supposed to be fixed in your early 20s. Your personality is set through genetics and temperament, and kind of, you know, how extroverted or introverted or open or not is relatively set, except in this trial here, psilocybin, 14 months later, um, and those that had a, a higher degree of mystical experiences were much more likely to have enduring changes in the openness domain, so more open to fantasy and interested in aesthetics and feelings. And these people were more open. Um, from a discrete pharmacologic event, they had greater degrees of the dimension of openness 14 months later, which is really remarkable because in psychotherapy, isn't that what we try to do? We try to make people more open to change and experience. It's certainly what we try to do in addiction psychotherapies like motivational interviewing. So um, with, to treat addiction, um, if we induce mystical and spiritual states, if we can increase the domain of openness, how can we leverage that therapeutically to treat addicted individuals? Um, and the important thing is what, what's in the container? Are we going to use standard addiction psychotherapies, um, such as motivational interviewing, or relapse prevention? And the, the evidence base for these psychotherapies for addiction has been well established. And so we have a lot of good addiction psychotherapies. But I think because we're also inducing these unusual spiritual states, I think it's important to have some part of the psychotherapy that has some component of this, whether it's mindfulness or whether it's 12-step facilitation. I think that they go uh, well together. And I, I really love the idea of doing a study of including something like AA, because I, I think um, you really need to be in a community of recovery for it to be sustained. I, I really think that, that that's vital after treating addicts for a long time. And we're trying to figure out single versus multiple dosing. Um, and again, the data that Michael showed, the effect is worn off after you know a year or so. And so we really don't know the dosing frequency, and that's important um, to figure out. Uh, but we do know, um, in terms of dose, this study um, done by Roland uh, at Hopkins shows that as you increase dose, you reliably increase the intensity of the mystical state. Um, and not only that, you or in an orderly way, you increase positive attributes related to the drug that's uh, dose dependent. Um, and again, individuals that had 20 or 30 milligrams, you know, almost 100% of them said it was the single or top five most significant experience in this dose response study. So, uh, but there is between 20 and 30, the, the rate of adverse psychological events does go up. So, and Michael's data is interesting that around, you know, this dose here, some alcoholics are having almost no experience. So maybe there's something biologically that's different that, um, that their sensitivity to the drug is altered in some way through alcohol's effects, perhaps on, on glutamate uh, and other compounds. So just two more slides. Um, so this is Michael, and, uh, and actually Rick Straussman restarted the field of hallucinogen research in the early 90s. So he, he was a real pioneer that got this restarted and really provoked the FDA and NIDA uh, to take a look at this. And um, Rick was able to get um, research going at, at New Mexico, and Michael really is picking up the torch uh, from that. And, and we have Bill Miller here, who was the founder of motivational interviewing. And, and I think it was just brilliant for Michael to come up with the idea of psilocybin-assisted motivational interviewing. Um, and so Michael's data is really great, and we've been talking about um, having a multi-site trial now with alcoholics, but, but for me, I'm particularly interested in a similar design, but how can we use, at the end of this 12-step facilitation, an entry into AA? Um, and in a way, this is sort of like uh, the reverse of what happened uh, to Bill Wilson, or, or, you know, I think, Bill, it's interesting that AA has sort of changed from this organization that was founded by a guy that had a drug-induced experience who believe in antidepressants, which um, there were sort of splinter groups that um, were, uh, it got to the point you couldn't be on psychotropic medication and go to AA, you can't be on methadone because it means you're still using. So I wonder what it would be like to go to an AA meeting and say, well, I'm sober, day 14, and they, oh, they clap for you, that's great, and then you say, and I just did psilocybin, and it was awesome, you know, whoa. And then, uh, so that, that part so we're trying to figure out how do you, you know, because it doesn't matter what got you sober, whether it's a near-death experience or psilocybin or whatever. You're here sober now and you don't want to use drugs. And, um, and so I think that it would be important to think of this link and, and optimizing that. Um, and again, to just think of what would be the mechanisms of action. And it could be more than one. You know, is it the biology of the compound? And if that's the case, what sort of neuroplastic changes or long-term uh, changes at the gene level or otherwise could account or 
structural brain changes for effects, you know, one dose, one experience, positive effects months later, and, and what kind of learning mechanisms are involved and psychological change mechanisms and spiritual, religious. And again, I think it's important to look at the social domain. Um, we're social creatures and social um, influences can really help us um, sustain positive changes. Um, so uh, I'm gonna stop there and um, take questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for your talk. Uh, you gave a really nice historical overview of the trajectory of psychedelics research um, in clinical use, and you talked in part about the cultural backlash coming from this idea that um, you know, a kid somewhere took a psychedelic, and uh, uh, which coincided with a schizophrenic or psychotic break. And then you said something like, uh, psychedelics don't cause schizophrenia. I've encountered that sentiment a lot from skeptics of clinical research into psychedelics. And can you say just a little bit more about that? Well, if you, if you give someone uh, LSD, someone who takes LSD who does not have a family history of psychosis, who's not predisposed to psychosis, um, acutely within the order of um, hours or so, it can uh, create a state that within psychiatry we would call psychosis or psychotic-like. If people retain the sense that they're on a drug and they have reality testing that they're altered, then they're not psychotic. If they lose track of time and who they are, they can become psychotic. But um, that does not endure. The psychosis from the serotonergic hallucinogens does not endure. Only drugs like crystal methamphetamine, PCP, and alcohol can occasion enduring psychosis in people that don't have an underlying diathesis. Um, but people that are prone to schizophrenia, these drugs, like other drugs like cannabis and amphetamines, can induce psychotic states, either first break or relapses. So they're, they're problematic in that population for sure. So I'm a private capitalist and I'm most interested in the mechanism of private industry in making these types of interventions more widely available. Um, one of the one of perhaps the most significant criticisms um, that uh, in private industry we're likely to encounter is that um, even though we know these aren't necessarily novel treatments, um, these are novel treatments and there um, is insufficient research to um, support uh, the uh, efficacy of, of uh, these interventions. And so um, I'm, I'm particularly interested really um, as a as a function of, of business practice, as a function um, of business model, uh, a tighter integration between uh, the research that's necessary to inform the very clinical practices that that private industry uh, provide to patients. Um, Stephen, do you have any thoughts about um, uh, about how best to do that, or or? Um, yeah, that's my question. Yeah, it, it's, it's very hard to do the research um, in part, among others, uh, the resource uh, issue. That um, The studies that, that I run uh, at NYU and Bellevue that are uh, funded by NIDA, you have a real research budget that you, know, you have a whole team. When we first started doing this research, because NIH will not yet fund it, we had a very tight budget that really was not powered enough from a resource perspective. And once we had enough resources, it changed everything. Once we had a project manager, we were able to pay our therapists, it powered the study. And the, the NIH and governmental agencies will not yet fund these studies, so we absolutely need um, private individuals and private venture philanthropy to get these studies going and to move forward. And we can move so much more quickly, but we, we're limited by resources. So there needs to be some help from you know, these private entities to, to kind of power the research. Thank you. Yep. Hi, Dr. Ross. I'm a medical student at UCSF, but I guess I'm there for the wrong era of empathy research. Um, I was wondering a little bit about, in your cancer study, why you're allowing both psychedelic naive and psychedelic experienced patients, given that that could be a confounder, or you think there's not a substantive difference in potential outcome between those groups? Well, there, there may be. Um, we, you know, we, we don't exclude people. I mean, we, there are some places where they'll exclude people if they've had more than a certain number of experiences. We, we decided not to do that. We wanted to, to see, you know, I mean, in a way, this is a pilot study. And I think in future studies, uh, we would want to look at and correlate, does it matter if someone's had an experience or not? Uh, but certainly, if somebody is hallucinogen naive, it, it decreases some of the expectancy effects. But it's, it's really important. Not only is it important to know if they've had a prior experience, their religious or spiritual frame is vital. And that's why we do an extensive spiritual history. Someone who's an atheist 
is might have a much different experience than someone who's very religious. Although we, we've had atheists in the trial that have had profound experience. We have um, one woman, she had a, an encounter with a transcendental force, um, which was very important for her therapeutically, but she came back and said, well, I still don't believe in God. I'm still an atheist, but wow, that was pretty powerful. And she developed a kind of um, spiritual practice based on that. So it will ultimately be interesting to understand one's frame of reference due to you know, pharmacologic agents they've taken or, or experiences.